Hello, everybody. Welcome to Concurrent Session 3, uh, AI Machine Consciousness. We have five speakers. I think uh, two are... No, I think more than... No. Two are here, I hope. At least two are here. O'Leary? Is O'Leary here? Anyway, we have a, uh, two or three uh, live and two or three remote. The first speaker, I'm pleased to introduce someone who's uh, spoken at our conference on a number of occasions, Yosha Bach from Intel Labs in California, uh, The Origin of Consciousness in the Evolution of Governance in the Society of Mind. Let's welcome Yosha. So some preliminaries to get out of the way what we are talking about and which way we understand it here. Um, consciousness is colloquially known as the feeling of what it's like. And I separate it into uh, the awareness and attention to features and objects, which I call content consciousness. Then we have access content, uh, consciousness, which is attention to the mode in which we attend. For instance, whether the thing that we are attending to is hypothetical or conditional or um, uh, treated as real. And then we have reflexive consciousness, which is attention to attention itself. And to me, this question whether uh, the being is conscious amounts to the question of whether it's acting on a model of its own awareness, whether it's aware of the fact that it's aware and this is reflected in its actions. And in this way, I can conclude that, for instance, a cat is actually conscious because the cat is aware of the fact that the cat is aware and is able to communicate about these shared states of awareness with me and recognizes my own awareness. The functional role of consciousness is sometimes debated. I think that it can be understood roughly as the conductor of our cortical orchestra. It's, the purpose of the conductor is not to play the music. The purpose of the conductor is to make sure that the music is coherent. If we are unconscious, for instance, if we go up at night sleepwalking, then the instruments can still be playing. We might be able to open the fridge and concoct a meal and so on, but this is without, there's nobody home who is making sure that the orchestra is playing a unified tune. So this attentional awareness and the integration of what's happening, that is the main functional role. And this uh, is congruent with some other adjacent models, for instance, Michael Graciano's idea that consciousness is functionally control model of attention, or Joshua Bengio's idea that uh, consciousness amounts to the search for a low dimensional discrete function that minimizes the energy state of the perceptual model. It's basically an attempt to govern your perception in such a way that you can find a set of parameters that make, makes reality snap into a piece where everything makes sense. You know this thing when you wake up in the morning and you try to get reality to make sense, where you try to get the features in an arrangement that gives you a cohesive model of a reality that you're part of. This is like taking breaths and imagine you would not be able to take that breath. Right? It would be like drowning in a world that makes no sense. What's the ontological status of consciousness? There's a lot of confusion around the obvious fact that physical objects cannot be conscious because they're just mechanical and mechanical um, processes themselves are not conscious. And um, biological systems can also not be conscious per se. So a cell is probably not conscious, an organism is itself not conscious because it's an arra a mechanical arrangement of cells. And there is a coherent pattern, the activity of the cells that coordinates them and gives an advantage. And uh, this, these coherent patterns are able to perform modeling uh, tasks and would be very useful for the organism what it would be like to be a person. So it creates an as if person in an as if world, it's completely virtual. So consciousness is a virtual property. When Christoph says that simulations cannot be conscious, only physical systems can be conscious, I think he has it exactly backwards. You can only be conscious in a simulation, in a dream. Physical systems cannot be conscious. So uh, there are a few questions about how consciousness comes about. For instance, the, our genome is pretty sparse. There's not that much data in the genome to decide how our brain should be wired up. And our um, mental states are extremely complex and they're very diverse. And uh, they're also very robust. So if you have developmental problems in your, uh, encoded in your genetics or due to endocrine disruptors, then your brain will still find some kind of order that makes you conscious and makes you somewhat coherent. And also we are very adaptive in the sense that when you put us in a different environment, we might develop a different mode of interacting with the world in a different way to relate to our own self. So how is it possible to implement all this with neural circuitry that is encoded in the genome? And there are some interesting ideas that go away from the notion of 
circuits as there are existing in our classical computers. For instance, Stephen Grossberg uh, has written a fascinating book, uh, Conscious Brain, Resonant, uh, Conscious Mind, Resonant Brain, in which he explains how consciousness emerges over resonators uh, that are implemented in neurons. And uh, Jerome Busemeyer explores the uh, idea of using quantum probabilistic models to uh, describe mental states, not because he thinks that the brain is literally a quantum computer, but because he thinks that the mathematics that we need to understand mental states have to account for the superpositions and uh, in, in uh, the way in which the mental representations relate to the substrate in themselves. There is, for instance, a collapse of the observer that happens in the brain when we become conscious of something, where we collapse probability space into a single interpretation and start to interpret our own history as if it had been a sequence of events, while it was a superposition of possibilities. Another perspective comes from Marvin Minsky, The Society of Mind, where he treats the mind as a collection of interacting agents, where each of these agents is self-motivated, and as a result, you get a self-organizing process. And what I really like is uh, Gary Edelman's idea of neural Darwinism. So this idea is that uh, the organization of your mind is not something that is completely defined in your genome in some sense, and then imposed as some kind of uh, pathways and circuits in your brain, but rather there is a potential of different orders and they fight it out. So, so there is an evolution of possible mental organization in everybody's mind during our own development. And this evolution is of course rigged. So the outcome is predetermined by the way in which these genetics are set up. But this means that you do not need to set it up in detail. You just need to set up the bifurcation points, the criteria for which organization is better than the other ones, some hints to, uh, to get it closer to one organization or the other. So in some sense, it's comparable to uh, the Darwinian evolution between different systems of social organization in society. Right, there are somewhat optimal social organizations in society depending on their economy and scale and context that they're in. And the order that you find is something that takes often generations to develop, but it's an evolutionary process by which political systems develop. And so in some sense, the organization of ourself and our conscious mind could be understood as some Davinian evolution for different forms of governance. And what I want to introduce here is an implication of this, which is what is the seed for this conscious mind? What is the seed agent that is branching out? And to understand these principles of self-organization in nature, we need to understand some ideas from cybernetics. An open loop means that you are acting on the environment without getting any feedback. And most of our robots are in the sense open loop. The industrial robot grabs a piece, expecting that it's in a certain position and puts it into a different position, expecting that its notion of space is still correct and not out of alignment. And if it goes out of alignment, somebody else needs to come in and recalibrate. But if you give the system feedback, you have closed loops and you have adaptive controls, so you can adapt to changes in the environment. But what's crucial for organisms is, and for social systems is that, is that they have extending loops, that they branch out and build new loops into the environment, that they probe the environment for things that can carry them and become their substrate. So you take the chaos that you find around yourself in the environment and turn it into complexity, complexity that you can settle, that you can expand into, that you colonize. So these extending loops require some kind of minimal seed, something that is able to turn chaos into complexity, that is able to branch out. And uh, this basically is the foundation of the inside out design of biological systems. Now, what is inside out design? It's the opposite of outside in design, technological design. When we design something in technology, we start out with a deterministic lab or workspace or floor, and then we have some substrate that we extend the determinism into, that we structure using the tools that we have. So we go outside in from a space that we know how it works, that we completely control and extend this control by building new machinery. And biological systems don't work like this and social systems don't work like this. They work with a seed and this seed is branching out into the world. And so for instance, when you have a tree, this, uh, initially you don't have a tree. Initially you have something that wants to become a tree. So you need a kind of organization that is a precursor to a tree and that is able to branch out. And then organismic grows, you do not have a single seed that colonizes, but in multicellular organisms, you have many. And the cells can rely on each other because they have a shared destiny and they are, have mechanisms that are very similar to each other so they can link up and form an organization on the next level, some kind of next level agent. What is an agent? The simplest form of an agent is a controller for the future. 
you know, a controller from cybernetics, the famous example is the thermostat. The thermostat itself is not an agent, right? It's only acting on the present frame. It doesn't want anything. But give the thermostat the ability to model the future and integrate the temperature differentials of the future. So it sees that the world is branching in different paths depending on decisions that the thermostat is making at any one point. Suddenly there are world branches that are preferable and not preferable. And now you have a system that is acting on plans and has intentions. It's, it's, it's relatively simple. You just need a controller that is able to control the future. And to control the future, of course, you need to model it. And to model the future, you need to have a system that is a causal structure that is different from what the world is now. Right? So you need to insulate something. You need to make your own universe, your own universe in which the future plays out, despite the universe not having happened yet in your universe where you actually live. Right? To, to build this hypothetical universe in which the future happens now, even though it's not yet happening, the minimal thing that you need is a computer. You need a system that has an independent causal structure. And uh, the simplest computers that we know to exist in nature are cells. Cells basically uh, have a read-write tape like a Turing machine with, with a read-write head on, uh, on it and they, they can change state. It's more complicated than this, but they're basically computers among other things. And this allows cells to regulate future states, to, adapt, to anticipate future states, to anticipate disturbances that haven't happened yet and to regulate for them. And this gives us insight into a hierarchy of causal systems. At the bottom of the hierarchy are simple mechanical components. The next step are controllers. And then we get agents which are, have decoupled computation and uh, they have integration of future rewards. So they expect what the future is going to be like and act on these expectations. And then on the next step, you have group agents. Group agents combine the individual motivation of their members, like the individual cells, with the greater whole, and they are, get subordinated to this greater whole, the individuals. And this happens, for instance, in a pack of wolves or in a family unit. And then the next step above this is a state building agent. A state building agent is a group that scales beyond reputation systems, beyond knowing each other. And then you have infinitely scalable state building agents. So if, if this relation between a group and a state is very interesting. A group agent, like this pack of wolves, works because all the members know each other and they can model each other and they can have an economic exchange. It's transactional in a way. In a state building system, you interact with strangers and you act, uh, interact, expect them to behave rule-based, even if it's not locally in their best interest. So this requires some kind of domestication. And cells are state building agents when they form multicellular organisms and ants are famously state building agents and social insects and humans are state building agents. And we have not always been state building agents. It's a, a feature of domesticated humans, of uh, the modern homo sapiens, that we enter these infinitely scalable states where we're willing to act on rules, even if we do not understand uh, where they come from. This domestication is extremely crucial for our success. We are not the smartest hominid, we are the programmable hominid. And there are uh, infinitely sta scalable state building agents that are difficult to achieve. The uh, larger social systems become, the harder it is to set the incentives for governance correctly, right? So this is a problem that happens to all organisms. There are basically almost no organisms and states in nature that can grow indefinitely. And that's because of the communication overhead and the trade off is at a bit. But some of them have found a solution. For instance, what you see here is a cove of trees and they're all a single organism. They're all connected by their roots and they're all clones of each other. They're basically the same tree. And uh, this thing can grow, but it cannot adapt. It's basically frozen in time. If, uh, that if they would update in its genome, it would not fit together anymore. And another example is a species of um, South American dwarf ants, and they form infinitely scalable colonies and have taken up the habitat of many species of ants in Europe, for instance. And uh, apparently human states are to some degree scalable, almost indefinitely so, and we don't know what the limit is for this. But you have a trade-off when you do this, you have a communication overhead, uh, or you have uh, an overhead between, uh, trade-off between activity and coherence. So uh, the, the crucial thing to make such organization work is to have a government. And the government is an agent that is making your individual behavior compatible with the common good by changing your payoff metrics. So making sure that you get the right rewards and punishment. So there is an offset to your local payoff to make you uh, actually act on your own incentives. And by acting on your own incentives, you are acting on the common good. 
and setting the incentives for governance right is the most crucial thing. And in some sense, the part of the role of consciousness in our own mind is to create this coherent governance to act as this conductor. So the thing that emerges in all of these systems is something like a virtual operating system. All operating systems are virtual. It's virtual machines that control the future. And they exist in organisms, minds, groups, nation states, and so on. And the old word for these operating systems, for the software that emerges in the coherent interactions of individual agents is spirit. Right? It's this word that we have forgotten in our civilization, but uh, that word was needed before. And there is a non-superstitious reading of what the spirit is. It's really an operating system for an autonomous robot invented at the time when the only autonomous robots known were things like plants and people and nation states and cities and ecosystems. Mm -hmm. And some spirits are sentient, not all of them. And sentience is the ability of an agent to model the world so deeply that the agent discovers itself in its interaction with the environment. So it begins to know what it's doing. And many social organisms are not sentient. So we can build social organizations that have agency and that people serve, but not at all of these groups that emerge know what their interaction with the world actually is and what they are. Our Western world tends to be very confused about consciousness. There's this notion of idealism that we live in a dream, and I think that's basically correct. There's also the notion of physicalism, that there is a causally closed mechanical layer at the bottom of everything. That also seems to be correct because we have to explain why everything is so regular, right? But uh, we are confused in our society on how to put these notions together, that we actually do not live in a physical world, but that we live in a dream, and this dream is dreamt by a mind on a higher plane of existence. And this higher plane of existence is physics, well, that nobody has ever seen and can never see because you cannot be conscious out there in the physical world. You can only be conscious in a simulation created in the skull of a primate. But it's something that our culture has known before and many other cultures know. So one of the oldest stories that we have is in our culture is Genesis 1. And uh, we get taught about it from the Christian perspective, which sees this as a bootloader for a cult. And uh, in, in this reading of the Christians, uh, Genesis about, is about the creation of a physical universe by a supernatural entity, right? And this makes no sense because the entities that are being described in Genesis are not physical entities. There are no colors and objects in physics. They are created by our mind to make the patterns at our systemic boundary to the physical universe intelligible to us, right? But if you, if you take this reading and you reread the whole thing, turns out this is a six stage theory of development of consciousness and personal self. Stage one is that this creative spirit, which is in, the, uh, in Genesis is called Ruach Elohim, creates uh, two domains, the domains of the ideas and the domains of the world. Descartes calls this res extensa and res cogitans, the world of stuff in space and the world of ideas. And both of them are in the mind. And it, it starts out this whole story by the creative spirit moving over a substrate that is tuhu va bohu, it's void and formless. And then it uh, manages to produce light out of the oscillations of neurons and separate it from darkness. So you got contrast. And then it associates the light with brightness and uh, the darkness with the absence of light, with, with the night. At stage two, the thing starts to separate the, uh, the contrast into space by measuring extensions along several dimensions. And it separates spatial regions. And it divides between the world and the ideas, this area where you have stuff in space and stuff that is not in spaces. In stage three, it discovers that there is a plane that is, can associate with the ground. And that there's a space above this plane, which is um, the sky and everything below the sky. And it discovers how to model solids and liquids and organic shapes. Basically, it builds a game engine of our brain that is able to model reality. In stage four, it discovers illumination and the constancy of shape under changing light. And it discovers that the illumination has to come from something. It discovers the light in the sky, the sun, and that sometimes changes and uh, light changes with the flow of time. In stage five, it discovers all the plants and animals and starts giving them names and it develops language. And in stage six, it discovers that its purpose is to control the world and its interaction with the world and that there needs to be an agent which does this. And so it goes to work and it builds an agent in its own image, something that is able to comprehend reality and act on it. 
but it does not create them as this creative spirit. It creates them as men and women, as a personal self, as somebody who thinks they're a human being in a social world. And when you observe children, you notice that there is a face after they're born when they are not people, when there is no person, but they have this unified creative perspective where they are just observing reality as it is. And then it switches. There is a person that they are describing. And initially they describe this person very often the third person. And then more and more often they use a first person perspective because they start to model the world from this new perspective. And you will find that as a break in their memories when they switch over, because they seem to re-index their memories from this new perspective. There's a new relevance, right? There is a new self emerging in the sentient mind. And I think that's a very beautiful theory that approximates pretty well of how modern cognitive science sees the development of the mind. And with this, I uh, want to end the talk. My time is up. Uh, the illustrations that have been used recently have been created by DALI, a new um, generative uh, AI um, that has been trained on a few hundred millions of images by OpenAI. And um, this image, which you see here, was generated by the prompt, the, generation, uh, the creation of no, the emergence of consciousness from the universe automaton. So this is what the AI thought after having looked at 400 million images and doing statistics over them. <laughs> Thank you, Yosha, for an extremely interesting talk and finishing precisely on time. We have time for a few questions and step up to the microphone. Here comes Sue. Wow, you gave so many amazing ideas that I'm kind of reeling. I'll just comment on two, one comment and one question. Comment is, I really love the idea that, not because Koch's wrong, because I, you know, I don't mean that meanly, I mean, that, that switching around from, um, is, the, is it the physical that we've got to understand? That's clearly the, the, the problem, the hard problem. So you get rid of it, but in this way, what? Surely, no, you haven't really got rid of it, have you? But <laughs> what, what I found so interesting was back in 1986, I wrote something like that and then lost confidence. What I said was, there's nothing it's like to be a bat. There's only something it's like to be the bat's idea of a bat. Would you agree with that? Yes, I would. Yeah. I then lost confidence because I didn't really know what a representation was. And I've been playing around with representational theories and, and that's what you're doing. So I want to look much more into, into your work there. So that was just a comment. The other thing I'd like to ask you about is the um, uh, neural Darwinism um, of Edelman, which appeals to me very much from my work on replicators and memes and, and so on, and the competition between um, constructions between representations. So would you say um, then if, you, if, if he's right and what's happening is kind of fight between different representations going on in, in the brain, uh, we would you take a panpsychist view on that and say that all of these competitive things, there's something it is, I, this is where I feel myself forced to and I don't you know, normally speak about it publicly, so. but would they all, would those competing things, there'd be yeah. something it'd like to be each one? I think of panpsychism as the idea that uh, consciousness is out there in physics, but because we cannot understand how the physical mechanisms give rise to this by the interaction between physical parts, it's an intrinsic part of matter that you cannot split up from it. And that's indistinguishable from consciousness being outside of our universe and generated in a parent universe. The issue is with panpsychism that uh, in an ontological sense that people who believe that uh, it's actually primary and matter is generated from consciousness is that consciousness seems to be very complicated, more complicated than matter. And it seems to be compositional and constructed because I notice that I can deconstruct my own consciousness. I suspect that consciousness might be something that is intermediate, that exists between discovering your uh, self and your second order attention and deconstructing it. And it could be that basically when you live long enough and you were able to observe yourself long enough that you would get into a state where you just deconstruct all your qualia and you might have noticed for phenomenal experience for qualia, you can deconstruct them. You can take them apart into components that are no longer qualia. They're just representations. And uh, typically Buddhist meditators call this uh, going towards enlightenment states where basically everything becomes apparent as a representation. And so I don't see 
uh, panpsychism in the sense as a useful theory. I see it more or less as the insight that the world that we think is the physical world, because everybody in school tells us what you touch here is physics. Uh, and you realize that's actually a dream and it supervenes on my mind. And that's actually true, right? Because the thing that you observe and you touch this thing is not out there in physics. It has to be generated in your mind. It's a simulation generated in your brain. And when you deconstruct yourself and the simulation, you realize there's a mind below it. And that mind is not you. That is the creative spirit. That's taken us in another. Yes, yeah, sorry. <laughs> I still want We can to discuss later. <laughs> Thank, uh, I appreciate your talk. Th th thank you. But uh, I noticed that, that you um, refer um, only to um, reflective consciousness and reflective self consciousness, like in your first uh, slide. But according to me, that is, is only an alpha of the phenomenon. Consider the uh, non-reflective consciousness, like mirror self-recognition, for, for instance. Um, uh, is this able to make the difference in your account or not? I'm not quite sure what you mean by non-reflective consciousness, but to but, uh, I, I, uh, recognize yourself I, I, in the I, mirror, I, I, you don't need to be conscious. You can build a robot that is not conscious and is able to recognize itself in the mirror as a complicated pattern. And uh, some people argue that uh, today's neural networks might be slightly conscious. I'm not convinced that they are. Uh, I, I think that they do not have a, uh, an awareness of the fact that they are aware for the most part, but they're able to create a coherent story to some degree about something that is. So at this level, at this level where you have this multimedia narrative of, uh, of a thing that uh, conceptualizes itself as conscious inside of the simulation, the simulacrum of a conscious being. You can have that conscious, but you do not have it as the level of the mechanism that recognizes itself in the mirror. You don't need to be conscious to do that. You just need to be, make a machine that is good enough at pattern recognition. Very much. Yeah, let's give Yosha a great second speaker. Yeah, uh, the next speaker is Pietro Perconti from the group of Antonio Cella and Ricardo Manzotti. And uh, Pietro is uh, working at the uh, University of Messina. It's, oh, it's you. Amazing. Thank you. And uh, uh, he is. Uh, presenting an avatar to deal with psychological distress. Yes. And uh, this avatar uh, is using ideas from the research into consciousness. And so it uh, is focusing on volition and embodiment and valence and so on, it integrates this in the model. I'm very exactly. curious about your talk. Okay, the, this talk is co-authored by uh, Antonio Kelle and Riccardo Mazzotti. Maybe they at, attend the conference, but in Europe is, uh, we are in the middle of the night. <laughs> and Okay, the outline is basically divided, divided into two parts. So the... Uh, um, a sketch out of the project Alter Ego and uh, the focus on the uh, trust and deference in humanoid robots. Well, the uh, background idea uh, is to take advantage from the nowadays uh, techniques, uh, technological advances in uh, chat box, uh, and in uh, assistant uh, like uh, Alexa or uh, Siri and so on, or chat box in the website, and uh, to produce a um, more sophisticated avatar uh, endowed with two traits, uh, embodiment 
and uh, the uh, attempt to have a personalized uh, uh, avatar, a, um, an individual, not a, a simple example of uh, an, uh, an, 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 a cognitive architecture. Mm. The existing boards lack essential aspects of successful human communication. All, all, all of us are, are aware of this. Uh, we are upset uh, a, a lot of time speaking with Alexa or Siri and so on. Um, to get an, an ecological in, uh, interaction between humans and machines, uh, we, you need a lot of capabilities or abilities, of course, of, from social cognition to mirror self recognition and so on. And in, uh, in what follows, I will, will focus on the issue of trust and red and deference in uh, relationship between humanoid robots and uh, humans. We, ha we have uh, a, a social problem, the problem to be to becoming familiar with robots, uh, especially with humanoid robots. And uh, the question I would like to address here is how does people could become familiar with such artifacts? And what kind of problems does su such familiarity Race. We have, uh, on the whole, uh, three kinds of problems ergonomic problems, cross cultural problems, and moral problems. Ergonomic problems are articulated in, into two parts classical ergonomics and cognitive ergonomics. Classical ergonomics go because, after all, Humanoid robots, uh, robots are physical object. So we have to deal with this problem. But uh, they are artifacts. And uh, we, ha we have also cognitive ergonomics because our artifacts are endowed with their psychology on their own, like cars, for example. Cars uh, sometimes seems to be smiling. Some, sometimes uh, they, they seem to be aggressive. Uh, and designers are perfectly aware of this and uh, produce this feeling in us. We have also cross-cultural problems. Consider, for example, the Japan case uh, and the different attitude Japanese have toward humanoid robots in comparison with uh, uh, Western people. Um, Japan is the, um, the best place in, uh, uh, in the world in uh, uh, humanoid uh, robots investigation. And th this is not surprising, of course. Uh, Japan is a uh, uh, an amazing country, but my point is uh, their cultural attitude towards humanoid robots, a positive attitude. Um, on the contrary, Western people are characterized by a twofold attitude toward uh, humanoid robots. On, on one hand, uh, Western people feel fear towards uh, humanoid robots. Or, on the other hand, they would like to enslave them. And uh, we, we can call these uh, like a uh, Frankenstein syndrome, typical in Western countries, but not in Japan. And I... I, I mm, Mm, there is not a empirical investigation about this, unfortunately. Uh, we can 
only speculate. And the speculation can, uh, it can be based on the preference for impersonal relationships, typically in, in Japanese, uh, just for kidding. Uh, if you consider a, a, a Japanese in, uh, in choosing between uh, a, 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 to get a ramen, for example, from a, 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 a restaurant or from a vending machine, maybe she chose the vending machine. Uh, and, and, and it is well known the Japanese dis discretion towards uh, the most intimate and personal sphere. Maybe this uh, uh, is able to explain the different attitudes Japanese and Western people have towards humanoid robots, but it is only speculation. We, we need uh, empirical studies. But above all, we have a lot of moral problems. And uh, this kind of problems arise, uh, arises from uh, uh, self-driven uh, cars, from killer robots, from sex robots, and so on. Moral problems uh, Mm, can be a uh, deal uh, with the two different uh, uh, accounts and two different problems. Uh, we have two problems, first of all. What are the ethics needed to govern relations with machines that have intelligence? And what ethics do machines uh, that are equipped with intelligence and self-awareness have? Mm. The first question is about uh, how uh, ethics to be used in relation to uh, machines. And the second question is devoted to the ethics uh, that machine themselves should have. And of course, there is a, the well-known uh, twofold uh, accounts from uh, top-down approaches to uh, bottom-up accounts. Uh, bottom-up accounts are, are a kind of developmental uh, robotics Mm. like in a book from, by uh, Cangelosi from uh, MIT Press. Mm. Okay, autonomous uh, driving cars uh, raise a lot of problems, uh, you, you know, but uh, I, I have to, to go uh, to going on and mm, it's better to consider maybe uh, killer robots, uh, especially for in these weeks in which uh, we have uh, uh, mm, the war in the uh, East, uh, East Europe and uh, the ban against uh, uh, killer robots is so sin significant in this moment. Uh, this ban exists and uh, a lot of countries around the world uh, ban killer robots. A, a, a killer robot is a killer that uh, is, is not differential towards human beings uh, uh, in the final choice to kill, but they kill by themselves. Mm. And this is banned. Mm. I don't know if this ban is uh, uh, really re realized, uh, applied, but the, 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 there is a ban uh, after all. Um, on the left of the, of the uh, slide, you uh, can see Harmony. Harmony is, is a 
It's a kind of doll, a sex doll, uh, but not exactly the sex dolls uh, typical in uh, over the last decades. A new kind of sex dolls, and people say that they fall in love. Uh, 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 they want to marry, marry uh, harmony. Mm, but is this really a right or not? According to Kathleen Richardson, not. And uh, she proposes a campaign against sex robots. Uh, this campaign was uh, until now unsus unsuccessful, and I would like to add, fortunately. According to Richardson, indeed, uh, we have to ban sex robots because uh, the relationship between human beings and sex robots is based on the idea of exploitation. And exploitation is, it is a bad thing among human beings. Mm, it is a, a kind of pedagogical concern that of Kathleen Richardson. Mm, maybe it, it is an, an exaggeration. According to me, sex bots are ethically neutral. In fact, for example, you can consider an, an alternative fetish account about sex robots. And you can consider the interest towards sex robots like a, 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 a fetishistic uh, interest. And uh, in this regard, uh, the ban sound uh, mm, absurd, senseless, because uh, a ban on fetishistic propensity seems to be uh, nonsense. How find a solution? This way I think. First of all, uh, we have a, a uh, we need ecology, and we need to consider that in the environment uh, uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, anthrop anthropomorphic mental triggers. Uh, when we are when when we find these cues in the environment, uh, we uh, feel the attitude to uh, attribute uh, intentional state to that object, no matter if the, that ob object is uh, uh, really endowed with uh, mental states. Mm, uh, my proposal is uh, uh, ontological neutral. Uh, I can uh, buy any ontology. Uh, all this is inspired by uh, uh, intentional stance by Daniel Dennett or uh, uh, Alan Turing uh, uh, imitation game. Um, uh, here doesn't matter ontology. Um, it is just a, a matter of uh, discover the grammar of the attribution of uh, mental states uh, to other object. And uh, um, uh, in the environment, uh, sometimes uh, we have some cues, like the uh, attitude to classify different living from non-living creatures. We, have, uh, uh, we, we are able to uh, uh, distinguish in an intuitive way, way without ed education, uh, biological motion, from artificial motion. Uh, the attitude to recognize a meaning, meaningful face uh, in, the, in the environment 
in perceptu in in a given perceptu per perceptive pattern, and uh, the ability to join attention with other people and to follow their gaze. When uh, we we are we are facing an environment in the environment uh, uh, with these uh, cues, uh, we are prompted to uh, consider that object like a rational agent. Pima Zalager and uh, his colleague, colleagues from the Donders Institute in Nijmegen in the Netherlands propose a sophisticated model how, on how trust works in human robots uh, interaction. And you can, uh, uh, you can see that uh, uh, the appearance, behavioral style, performance, not reputation, are similar to the mental triggers uh, above mentioned. And um, on, we have to consider the context and the human propensity to trust robots uh, based on the history of interaction and other things. Mm. The outcomes of trust in that way uh, seems to be miserable. Well, this is about trust, and, but we need something similar about deference. Indeed, trust and deference are two main epistemic component parts of social cognition, theory of mind, mentalization. Deference is not a popular epistemic attitude nowadays. Mm. Deference is not a good word now because uh, individualism and, uh, and a lot of good values. I, I, I completely realized that. that. But uh, I think that uh, we have to recall deference from the past because deference attitude, deferential attitude, was able to uh, produce uh, amazing uh, achievements in human history. In fact, while individual, in individual life, deference is often associated with the impotence, lack of enterprise, submission, like uh, in uh, other animals' uh, uh, cases, in social interaction, it is a in, 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 in an essential component of a constructive way of living together. Social difference, indeed, is not a social mechanism of submission, but an intelligent strategy aimed at maximizing personal utility and building productive social relationship. It is the attitude that leads the individual to take advantage of the best confidence that that's, uh, other people has with uh, a given area of knowledge and experience. We, have, we are differential when uh, we uh, mm, rely on a physician to diagnose and treat a disease, when we call uh, a repairman to fix an appliance, or when we consult a vocabulary uh, on the meaning of a given word. And this is not a treat of submission. This is smartness. And uh, we have a differential attitude towards cal calculators. Mm. In the calculator case, it's not just a matter of trusting the, cal the calculator, but of being differential to it. But we are ready to have the same attitude toward Grace, a new, a, a new humanoid nurse, 
maybe not. But, but why? Basically, basically, difference is a, a behavior, a behavioral attitude. While trust is an intentional, a pure intentional state. However, difference can also be associated with a mental state. So in this case, we have a differential attitude. And this is my take to home, take home message, the final message. Selective difference is an epistemic attitude able to create a hierarchy uh, among the kinds of social knowledge to be most differential towards. And the others in which the subject instead has a direct commitment to the semantic content of what she is saying. And this is important in the case of avatar because we have to distinguish the case in which our avatar, it is better to call back and uh, uh, become uh, another way, another time in charge. Okay, uh, just to advertise in, uh, in, uh, in the hand, uh, a book, a forthcoming book uh, on this futuristic uh, landscape. And uh, uh, at the hand, uh, just uh, uh, the invitation to join us uh, in the next conference in Italy uh, in uh, uh, next year in uh, in Sicily, Italy. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. We won't have time for questions, unfortunately, unless uh, our other speakers are gone uh, able. Uh, I don't know is, uh, is somebody with technical setup here who can uh, help. The next speaker would be Tahua O'Leary. And I don't know if he's here in person. I suspect that he is phoning in from, uh, from New Zealand and I hope that he does. Uh, yes, well, he's not, I am, I'm his co-speaker. Hmm. Is he here uh, or is he uh, present? Sorry, I didn't get catch that. Um, I'm speaking on his behalf. Oh, okay. <laughs> so just uh, so uh, you are. Uh, I'm his Canadian. Yes, <laughs> just okay. Uh, what you are presenting is, uh, I think, a proposal for a virtual world in which uh, we can gather resources, or a virtual agent does so, and develops its own agency, and we can use this as a paradigm to explore consciousness. That's correct. Is this all showing? Also, please introduce yourself. I only yes. know a uh, little bit about uh, Tahua O'Leary, but uh, who is an analytical philosopher in Auckland uh, and uh, did his um, PhD, at least in analytical philosophy. And uh, you are in a uh, lab for strong artificial intelligence, which I think is awesome. Please tell us about it. Take it away. Sure. Okay, so I am Dr. Joshua Bensman. I'm yeah, standing in for... Dr. O'Leary, who had something come up. Um, I myself am actually a psychologist turned computer scientist. Um, and what I am presenting today is a project that we are trying to get off the ground that is an attempt at studying consciousness through uh, the ev evolution of consciousness through simulations. Um, yeah, and because this is our proposal, we'd be interested in any feedback. Uh, our emails are up here. Also, I believe an alternative email for O'Leary is in the program itself. Cool. So what we are actually planning to do is, like I said, study consciousness through, uh, through simulations. Now, what we, are try what we are planning to do is to create a world that uh, replication is close as you know practically allowable of early earth ecology um, and then using different AI agents with different complexities which we'll get to in a second uh, running them through the simulation to see what they can achieve um, and using that as a way to determine what properties are important for the evolution of consciousness now the reason we're doing this is that there is you know, mounting evidence that things such as sociality and other certain problems we had in our ecological niche played a 
pivotal role for determining what how we evolved our consciousness and other cognitive components that are critical to the evolution of consciousness. So this general idea here is that consciousness, at least from our definition of consciousness, is that it didn't just appear out of anywhere, but it you know was built upon some other cognitive concepts that were selected from the environment. They were selected for a reason. Our belief is that you know, there are specific problems to help them solve. And if we can show which cognitive components were selected to solve specific problems, or at least provide evidence for that, then our goal is to show a possible plausible uh, evolutionary pathway to consciousness itself. Now, um, there we go. Like we said, uh, we both work in an AI lab at the University of Auckland. And the interesting thing about AI, I don't have to tell you at the AI and consciousness session, but it can actually help us inform our understanding of consciousness through a couple of different ways. Um, there are at least two that I know of. Um, one is, you know, determining what counts as an artificial consciousness. So this is a, if you work in AI, you know that what you can do now you couldn't do three years before that and three years before that and so forth. Basically, AI advances at such an uh, exponential rate that we are developing machines that are becoming more complex as time goes by, more intelligent, depending on your definition of what intelligence is. And at some point, you do start to wonder, when do these things count as being conscious? Now, this is obviously a difficult problem for multiple reasons. Um, for example, if you went to any of the other concurrents that are on right now, I'm willing to bet you'd find different definitions of consciousness. In fact, I'm pretty sure the other speakers in this uh, session have their own definitions of consciousness. So you get into this problem of, you know, how do you define consciousness? And if you can't define it, how can you tell what should be considered as conscious? And again, this applies to other animals, uh, you know, plants, anything you want to determine whether it's conscious or not, you need a definition and that's where the problems come in. Uh, us, we are focusing on the second point, which is the idea that if you were to trying to work out what's important for consciousness and why is it important. So what you can do is create a property that you believe is associated with consciousness um, and put it within an AI model. Now, that's the reason you do this is to see whether having that property helps the AI model solve specific problems. Um, so this is the sort of work that I've been doing recently and is the core behind this project. Um, if we were to put in, say, something like a theory of mind, what does a theory of mind help the agent do? And so can we find evidence that this property exists for a reason? And it's not just something that has occurred, but you know, something that might have been selected for specific reasons and to do with conscious uh, to do with our evolutionary history. So speaking of our evolutionary history, um, so we are approaching consciousness from the evolutionary perspective. I know that there are many different ways of how to, you know, theories of how we develop consciousness. Ours is yeah, coming from the Darwinian type point of view. Um, and basically what we're saying is that there were certain evolutionary pressures that led to us developing certain cognitive components. And by developing these components, things such as attention, communication, theory of mind, um, by developing those and a bunch of other components, we use them to solve problems. That meant they got retained to help us, you know, due to selection pressures. And then uh, these components were able to start to interact with each other. In other words, you might have attention, uh, say, communication and theory of mind start to interact. In other words, you learn how to discuss, you know, what you believe someone else is doing, something like that. And you will find that that suddenly helps you solve more problems. So because you have these base components that were selected for their own reasons, they then get a chance to interact. And some of these interactions lead to better improvements, but also increasing complexity. They then get retained and so forth. And so you get this you know, general hierarchical uh, form formation of all these cognitive components. And at some point, consciousness evolved from this. Um, that's, of course, assuming 
you're talking about an all or one, uh, all or none theory of consciousness, you know, suddenly you weren't conscious and suddenly you are. Um, you could also make the argument that, you know, different, if you think that there are different levels of consciousness, then, you know, the different combinations of these components would have different levels of consciousness. But the point here is that we assume that consciousness evolved from somewhere and that was due to, you know, our ecological niche. Okay, so what are we actually planning to do? Well, we have two separate components that will be co-developed and obviously interdependent. Um, one is our environment, which will be you know, based on early Earth ecology. Get to that in a second. The other is the AI agents themselves. Um, and we are planning to build these simultaneously and obviously keep iterating them. So the idea will be we'll build the environment with specific problems in mind. Um, and then, you know, we'll test different levels of agents with their own uh, different amounts of cognitive inspired components. Uh, but this could be a bunch of different, you know, mo uh, different models uh, that we maintain. Now, the goal here is that we will be continuously developing. So think of it as an arms race. If we build the environment with some problems and then we find that our agents can solve them quite easily, well, we need to make those problems more difficult. Um, and obviously that will cause a rise in the agents um, as you'll need more complex agents to solve those problems. And the thing we are planning to do here is to make our environment open source. So once we complete it, uh, we will, it will never be truly complete, but once we've made a first version of it, we are hoping to release it to everyone else so that people that want to, uh, to work with us or have their own things that they want to test, they can work with our environment. Okay, so as for the environment itself. Now, the thing we will be focusing on is early earth ecology. Um, we know that there are a lot of different AI environments out there. Um, that's not a problem, but for us, because we want to focus on consciousness and its evolution, we need to look at our evolutionary history. Uh, and things we will be doing is creating very complex, but ongoing problems. If you want to think of high level things like resource gathering and predation, now it's going to be a bit more complex than that because you can think of Pac-Man as being a resource gathering problem. You know, you're hunting dots and things are hunting you. So then that's predation. We're going to go for something a little bit more complex than that. Um, think of a situation where you have, you know, water in one source, food in another source, but you don't have enough. You you don't, you can't just eat at one and then move the other to solve your problem. You need to find something to help you basically learn how to bring either food to water, water to food, or to a third party location. Um, because we are also interested in things like sociality, we will be eventually building this up so we have multiple agents uh, working at the same time. Um, they can do that cooperatively, competitively. Again, our goal is to create the agents, add the components, and see how do these interact with our early earth ecology. So you could, in that previous scenario, imagine a situation where, you know, the group splits up, some go gather water, some go gather food, and then they bring them onto this location that they are defending from predators. That's what we're aiming to get to, of course. That would take a lot of time, but that's the general goal of what we're aiming for. Can we keep solving more complex problems with more complex agents? Um, as for the actual implementation, the first version we're going to do is going to be a 2D grid. Now, again, for those who are familiar with the idea of a grid world, which is where you have basically an agent moving around a grid, trying to find a reward and avoid pitfalls. We're gonna go a little bit more complex than that. Um, yeah, it's what we're doing is not completely different from other things. It's just we're making something that is more complex than what you would use for a standard AI agent because we're not interested in just making smarter agents. We're interested in learning how do different components of the AI help the, uh, help the agent solve specific problems.
Okay, so the second part of this is obviously the agents themselves. Now, there are a lot of different ways of how you can build a conscious agent. I know they generally fall into two parts. One is you define your architecture, you put them all into place and say, okay, this is my conscious agent. Um, the other strategy is you start with something really simple and start adding additional components to make it more complex, right? Um, so that's the, the second strategy is the one we'll be building with. Uh, to begin with, our agents will be nothing more than a simple random agent. And then we will build things in like tropisms. So, you know, move towards the specific stimuli. Uh, then you can build a bit of reinforcement learning on top of it. Um, and, you know, we will keep adding these components in as time goes by. Now, the thing is, we are assuming that these components are useful. And as you make an agent more complex, it generally performs better. But what we want to know is whether you gain, what you gain in complexity actually leads to a gain in performance. So say, for example, we had an agent that had beliefs, desires, and memory. Um, and then we tested it against an agent that didn't. And even though our beliefs, desires, and memory agent performed, you know, maybe 10% better than the previous agent, but we found that our more complex agent required, I don't know, 10,000 times as many computations to do that. It's like, well, we haven't really shown the, um, any benefit of these individual components. All we've shown is that making an agent more complex has led to, you know, better performance. What we'd be looking for something is, say, if we gave an agent memory and suddenly it required, you know, 10 times as many computations to use that memory component, but suddenly it scored or survived 100 times better, you know, showing that this little bit of inc increase in complexity lead to a greater gain. That is what we're after. Okay, so where are we with this? Now, I know there have been several projects in the past that have aimed to do just this, and they tend to vanish after a presentation at a conference. Um, we are actively building on this at the moment. Uh, it's a little dangerous to have a deadline on here, but at the moment, we currently have three different teams working on three different Type implementations of their environment. Two of them are showing uh, showing a lot of promise. Um, and what we are doing is, yeah, expect those finished by June, give us a bit of chance to work on what should be in our environment and what shouldn't, and then ideally make this available to anyone who is interested in at least trying out what we're doing. One thing I will point out is when you build an environment for computer science, there is this danger that when you build it, you build it with problems that you can solve. Um, so you're not really creating a general problem. You are just creating you know, something that makes yourself look impressive. We're gonna try and avoid this by using the you know, latest research on early earth ecology to work out what should be an environment and what shouldn't be. In other words, we're gonna you know, have other people solve that problem for us. Um, we also, because this is virtual, we are able to run the simulations as many you know, millions of times as we want. And we're going to put a bit of randomization in. So even if we do include something that shouldn't be there, sometimes it'll be present, sometimes it won't. And we will get a chance to actually see, you know, what does the effect of having this problem in your environment have on the, I wouldn't say evolution, but, you know, the complexity required to solve that problem. And that is effectively where we are and what we're going to do. So like I said, uh, this is still a work in progress. If you are interested in letting and talking to us about it, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, but other than that, I am finished for this presentation. Thank you very much for this presentation. I found it very interesting. Do we have questions from the audience? Yes, please come here. I just had a really quick question about the goal of the agents in the model. So like early humans seem to have complex goals around like survival and reproduction and food and political power. Like what is the, um, what's the goal of the agent? What, what, what are they trying to optimize for? Okay, so 
to start with, it will be survival, but we do want to, you know, again, develop towards things. Uh, so yeah, political power would be an interesting one, um, but that is that'd be future goals that would reach you. We don't want just one simple problem. Again, in AI, you have the tendency of creating things too simple so the agent solves them straight away. We want to make it complex and basically show that you can solve this, well, see what's required to solve these multiple problems simultaneously. Um, by the way, I've been working in the past in a similar paradigm. We built a virtual islands that was explored by virtual robots and they had to look for food and resources and interact with each other. The reason why we didn't want to build actual robots was the difficulty to get sensors and actuators to work in the real world to give rich affordances. And it's much easier to build affordances in the virtual world back then. But we also had this difficulty which you anticipate that the agents are only discovering what we put into the world in the first place. Don't think that randomization is the right strategy because it's going to make the world less deterministic, less structured. It's going to obliterate some of the logic of that world. And uh, so uh, at the moment, we have so many solutions for sensors that are ready made because we basically have systems that are trained on ImageNet and so on. Isn't it time to uh, build systems that can work both in the virtual world and uh, in the real world? I mean, it depends on what problem you're trying to solve. If you are trying to generate an artificial consciousness or a general agent, then yes, working in the real world and the virtual world is ideal. Um, for us, because we're more exploring the why do these components exist than working in the virtual, well, it's not going to be the exact example of the problem. It should help us provide evidence for there being a reason for this problem being solved or that this exists in the first place. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is going to be Giulio Ruffini. He is a, a physicist who is also the CEO of Starlab in Barcelona, uh, an institution that is working in uh, multiple areas, including neuroscience and AI, and is, uh, uh, he is working on a theory uh, about, of consciousness that is based on Kolmogorov complexity. And I'm very much looking forward to this presentation. So thanks for the kind of introduction. So I'm going to be talking about the framework uh, for the study of consciousness called KT. Um, and I have two collaborators that have been helping out uh, in the last year or two. So let me go on with the presentation. Uh, so here's a bit uh, the structure of the, of the talk. Uh, in seven parts, I will um, just start now with the motivation. Uh, the, and the motivation for the framework uh, can be provided in, from two different routes. One is the first person, first person or the experience route, or the other one is the third person or one uh, we call life, as you will see in a second, and the two lead to the same uh, place. So uh, the subjective route starts from the fact of experience, uh, the first person subjective standpoint. And we know from meditation, psychedelics, religious experiences, uh, that experience can be pure primordial, free of mental constructs such as the ego. And from uh, this and the self-evidence of our own experience, the what it's like to be, we, we start from the assumption that there is primordial experience that does not allow or require prior causes, okay? So in other words, the theory does not deal with the hard problem of consciousness. It assumes that there exists experience. And instead we focus on the problem of structure experience. So we aim to build a theory around the notion of structure experience where mathematics and experience meet. And by mathematics, I refer here to the a definition that I found per chance in the Encyclopedia Britannica that says that's the science of structure, order, and relation, which is quite fitting. Um, we do observe that experience is structure, at least during wakefulness, there is a spatial, temporal, and conceptual organization of our first person experience in the world, and that includes the self. So with this, we define structure experience as the phenomenal structure of consciousness that encompasses both sensory qualia and the spatial, temporal, and conceptual organization of our experience. And this is what we will aim to explain. Uh, as a scientific strategy uh, for this, the study of this structure experience, um, 
we observe that it can be explored in reporting humans, and we would like to characterize it with methods that then can be applicable to a broad range of systems, including artificial systems. The strategy will be to quantify the structure of experience from first-person reports, and then attempt to associate this with third-person data, such EG, fMRI, or behavior, or what, whatnot, whatever you can measure. And the association should be carried out using mechanistic insights derived from neuroscience and mathematics. If we are able to do this, then we should be able to study third, from the third person perspective, other systems, uh, such as non-reporting humans, other living species or artificial agents. And with this background, provide an educated guess, uh, because we cannot prove it, of course, about the agent's structure experience. The objective route uh, starts from uh, that attempting to define what life is. And from the observation that uh, what remains after the passage of eons must rightfully be called a persistent pattern uh, in the world. There may be different types of these patterns. Some may be uh, rather impervious to the world and static in a sense, such as protons. And um, there are other patterns, which we call life in the, in the framework, that uh, readily interact with the world, but persist by partly capturing structure in the world. Um, in the world, they, they inhabit either to stay for homeostasis or replicate, which we call meta-homeostasis, the replication of pattern. Uh, the connection with the first viewpoint, the one uh, or the first person viewpoint, is that Kate, in, in, this, in this framework, this generalized version of life, definition of life, is what is capable of structure experience. So as part of the program, we should also study the algorithmics of the emergence of life. So a few words about algorithmic information theory and color of complexity, because they provide the mathematical background to the theory. Um, so we can think of agents as physical systems, um, and in turn, of physical systems as dynamical systems calculating uh, effectively computable functions, right? Um, and this allows us to analyze agents from the standpoint of computation theory. So a warning here, because I've gotten this uh, remark sometimes, uh, computation is a mathematical concept. Uh, we're talking about three machines, essentially, or equivalent. And we should not be, this should not be construed uh, to mean that we are actually uh, in stating that the computer, that the brain is a, it's a computer like a laptop. Um, this computational perspective leads us directly to uh, the algorithmic information theory central concept, which is called more complexity of a data set. And this, uh, this concept uh, is basically the length of the shortest program capable of generating a data set. So the, the shortest program that is capable to generate or which can be used to compress a data set equivalent. equivalent. And here's an, an example of this um, prototypical example. On the left, you have a bunch of digits of pi. Uh, you can have as many as you want. They look random. Um, uh, for most purposes, uh, you cannot distinguish this from a random sequence. But in fact, it's a little program that actually generates this sequence. Um, and it's, it's very short. I mean, this list could be as long as you want, but the program itself is very, very short. And I provided it below uh, as, a, as a potential link with IIT, actually, uh, the program causal graph. So this is the causal relationship between the variables in the program, which presumably has something to do with the causal structure of, uh, of this program. Okay. Uh, another um, concept that we need from AIT is mutual algorithmic information, which is basically uh, the amount of algorithmic information in one string uh, that uh, can be used to compress or to generate another. So it's a generalization of the mutual information in, in Shannon terms, but in algorithmic terms. So if you have high mutual algorithmic information between two systems, it means that you can use one to compress or generate the other efficiently. A note on uh, programming languages. Uh, this probably will not be uh, very relevant for what comes next, but there's a hierarchy of different computational systems. And for the ones that we're mostly interested here, which are train machines, you do need recurring as part of the programming language. So you can have simpler uh, programming frameworks, but they are limited in what they can do. Turing machines are the ones that uh, can compute effectively computable functions, which we believe is what the physical world is actually computing.
Okay, so the concept of model, uh, which is associated to this uh, algorithmic information theory, uh, in, in KT and AIT, uh, we call a model, the model of a data set, any program that generates the data set. And there, are, there may be different uh, models that generate the same data set and they represent uh, perhaps different functions because the data set is finite. So you can have different functions that approximate the same data set, but they're actually different, or they might actually be the same um, uh, function implemented in different ways. And both aspects will probably matter. Um, we will focus on the ones, as I mentioned before, that uh, can implement the right functions succinctly. And this leads us to the optimal model of a data set, which is the shorter programs that generates or commit compresses the data set. Okay, so this is the, the definition of model that we use in the, in the framework. Now, for a model to be optimal, uh, an observation is that it needs to capture and exploit all the structure in the data set and nothing else. So, um, in addition, the structure of the model um, can be described by the group of symmetries of the data set. Okay, so this, is, this can be formalized, and I will not go too much into this here. But as an example, consider the example of uh, being given a stack of images of a hand that are actually generated by computer, for example, from uh, one sophisticated program, like Blender or something like this. Um, and you have actually generated using a simple function of some parameters. Um, here is a view of this, uh, of this potential images generated by the simple program. So the structure of the data set, which is actually maybe a huge data set, maybe a very long movie, gigabytes of movie in hand, uh, is actually a very short program that encodes the function. And this is actually the invariant object uh, in the theory. It's the model of uh, be behind in algorithmic terms, okay? Now, why are we talking so much about models and why are good models uh, good? Um, so the rationale for the importance of compressive uh, of, or succinct models is already a reflex of us, or as you know, of Occam's razor, that one should not increase beyond what is necessary, the number of entities required to explain anything. Okay, but why? Why should that be the case? Well, there are several potential answers to this. Uh, I here have a few. Uh, the universe appears to be simple. So simple rules, uh, we know that they can create as much complexity as one wants, and it appears that the universe is simple. So looking for simple programs, it's an advantageous strategy for model builders. Um, if the universe is generated by random uh, programs, uh, then, then simple programs will, are more likely to, to be the case because they are shorter, basically. Simple models uh, are unbiased and generalized better. This is part of Occam's principle, but they're already uh, also addressed by Laplace and James more recently. And of course, they're also easier to construct. Uh, so from a constructive point of view, starting simple uh, seems like a natural thing to do. Then they will be easier to store and reuse for model building as well. Okay, central hypothesis of KT. Uh, uh, which is using this background is that an agent or whatever uh, that agent may be formed by has uh, stronger and more structured experiences to the extent it has access to encompassing and compressive models to interact with the world, what we call good models here. Um, and more specifically that the event of structure experience arises from the act of successfully comparing these models, these good models with data. And that the structure of experience is actually determined by the, by the program structure, by the structure in the program, as I described before. Now, well, compressive, uh, so good models are compressive and encompassive. Compressive, I already uh, described uh, what they, they mean. Encompassing, encompassing means uh, to the amount, refers to the amount of data from the world uh, that is successfully captured by the model. And by, therefore, it's, it's explanatory potential. And in terms of algorithmic information theory, here we have to refer to mutual algorithmic information. So uh, models that have high mutual algorithmic information with the world. So just a remark that models are constructed by agents from information generated through the sensory motor system, uh, sensors and effectors that the agent may have. 
and uh, it should account for data generated by the world and also by the agent itself. And therefore, a self-model is a natural part of the model of the world that the agent needs to build. The algorithmic agent, uh, it's uh, an abstraction that uh, tries to capture the minimal set of elements needed for homeostasis of an algorithmic system. And um, this uh, goes back to uh, AI uh, in many disguises. Um, what is special about what's proposed here? Well, first you have this closed loop of interaction with the agent with the world. The world is a simple uh, generator of data. It runs simple models, provides input streams to the, to the agent. The agent has a modeling engine, which is in charge of creating, running, um, and predicting the future. And the act, uh, as I mentioned before, the act of uh, structure experience occurs when there is a successful match between the data that's coming in from world and from self, and is being matched by the model predictions. Uh, the agent also needs other bits to, to function and for homeostasis. One is clearly an objective function, uh, which defines um, valence and, and uh, it's fundamental for homeostasis and a planning engine that requires the modeling engine to create plans for the future and I'll put uh, actions into the world, which are bit streams as well. The, the algorithmic event of structure experience uh, is related, I think, uh, this NAND comparator I have here between comparing input streams and self-generated predictions. It's also part of a common theme now in, the, in, in neuroscience uh, you can um, you probably know about a predictive coding theory, in which you have bottom up, and uh, which is sensory information basically um, being compared to um, top down predictions from models at different hierarchical levels. And uh, so the comparators in neurobiology seems to be implemented uh, at different um, hierarchies. And in particular, it's also now it appears uh, this is the dendritic integration theory that suggests that this is happening actually in, in layer five pyramidal cells. Um, and this, uh, there's nice theories now uh, relating this to things like uh, anesthesia and consciousness, um, psychedelic experience, uh, Alzheimer's disease, etc. So uh, the next question that the model tries, that we try to address is uh, how do agents build models? And we find that uh, because of these different routes to KT that we are led to connecting the concepts of life intelligence and structure experience in doing this. Um, so both life and intelligence represent processes to construct simple models from the persistence, for the persistence of algorithmic information preserving systems across time. Um, so starting from resilient building blocks, uh, what we call before static persistence, as an example, protons, for example, but this could also be some amino acids, for example. Uh, from a computational perspective, life is an algorithmic process. Uh, program building carried not solely by the individual agent, but by, trans that by the transgenerational agent uh, through evolution for meta-homeostasis, for preservation of the kind. So this kind of an evolutionary learning paradigm, a model building paradigm, and intelligence uh, then is the consequence, is the, is the next evolutive uh, jump. Um, pressure gives rise to agents that starting from their static uh, models uh, that they have, build higher level compressive models of the world within their lifetimes uh, using what we call brains. From the point of view of the theory, both static model building, uh, static modelers and active modeling agents, uh, transgenerational, or not transgenerational enjoy structure experience, but of course their, their level and, and the structure of their experiences may be different. And I raise a question here for thought, what comes after life and intelligence in this model building hierarchy? A few words about dynamics. Uh, there is a connection of the theory, I believe, uh, with, uh, with, with dynamical system theory and, and uh, more particularly with, critically, uh, with critical phenomena. Here's a little chart that I that they have um, that tries to relate uh, KT, the theory of chromograph complexity uh, that I've just described uh, with IIT, and I will not go into this beyond the reference to the program cause of structure before and uh, critical IT theory. So here we will focus on this link. 
Um, the observation is that competition in nature is carried out by dynamical systems with very large degrees of freedom. Uh, we do uh, seem to observe that brains operate close to uh, the critical boundaries, um, consistent with notions of self-criticality. In fact, altered states of consciousness, such as anesthesia or psychedelics, for example, uh, appear to move the brain away or towards its critical state. So this raises a challenge for KT. So algorithmic agents, these dynamical systems instantiating compressive models of data, which itself has regularities and symmetries, they, this, these agents must have special properties. Uh, what, what could they be? So here I bring you back uh, for, and I apologize, this is a, perhaps the hardest part of the talk. Um, um, so I bring you back to the theory of the moving hand, uh, where you have images generated by a function of some parameters. This could be hand images, for example. And we observe that although the, the images themselves may be embedded in a very high dimensional space, is the space of pixels, one million dimensional, for example, the dimension is actually very small if the set of parameters controlling the hand function is small. Um, so the state of a dynamical system generating frames of the moving hand, your brain, for example, uh, regardless of how, how its natural space, state space is, for example, uh, with a large number of neurons, this dynamical system must be lying in a low dimensional subspace, a reduced manifold. So this low dimensional manifold embedded in a high dimensional system, how could it arise? So uh, criticality is one way. Um, near criticality, when the real uh, part of eigenvalues of the dynamics of the system are zero or close to zero, the dynamics collapses to low dimensional manifolds. Uh, we can think of this as constrained dynamics. So this can give an answer for these reduced manifolds. Um, symmetry. If um, if you have a Hamiltonian a dynamical system with constraints, um, uh, Netherstrom states that the Hamiltonian um, the dynamics is invariant. The group of symmetries. So you have here a connection between symmetries, constraints, and low-dimensional manifolds. So, for example, uh, uh, here you have very simple representation of what this very high-dimensional space would be. And the trajectory of the representation of, of a hand uh, in the reduced manifold would just be around this uh, little circle here um, as you move the parameter theta rotating the hand, for example. So you, you're embedded in a large space, but you're actually laying a small manifold. Um, so here we see that structure symmetry in the data, um, the collapse of the dynamics uh, to low dimensional to low dimensional spaces, criticality with its associated important features like maximal information flow, power loss, long time scales and enhanced susceptibility to perturbations. Cosmograph complexity and structural experience are deeply connected. Um, and the, 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 the emerging view uh, would be that the manifold structure of the reduced dynamics together with the mutual information provide respectively the metrics on the simplicity of the models and the amount of algorithmic information captured. The agent world log loop, this is an interesting observation, which tracks world data, this, uh, this uh, comparator system trying to predict the future, keeps dynamics on the reduced manifold um, and on a structure experience. So one can imagine that psychedelics, meditation, sensory deprivation, or neuropsychiatric disorders may lift up uh, the system from this enslaved dynamics into the higher dimensional manifold. And this is the loss of structure experience. Neurophenomenology. Um, so, neurophenomenology you know, defines a methodological strategy for integrating uh, the phenomenological and neurobiological accounts, first person and three person uh, data. Uh, we can rely on altered states of consciousness as psychedelics or meditation to, uh, as a context to study uh, the effects of perturbing the mechanisms behind structure experience. Meditative, medita meditation is also associated with a global dissolution of the embodied self. Uh, and, it, and for this uh, reason, it can also be uh, associated with this loss of uh, structural experience. Um, and, we can, and we need to find objective measures of structural experience from first person data. And uh, uh, one proposal that we have made is to analyze descriptive narratives in speech uh, through uh, state of the art uh, natural language processing to establish metrics on, on the structure uh, and, and semantic coherence um, of, of speech, for example, under psychedelics. This could provide some um, uh, 
principal way to study the structure behind, behind this. And in terms of the connection with the theory, then we have um, these dimensions of structure experience. The first person part is here. So this would refer, um, sorry, uh, to, uh, to this axis here, structure of experience. The realism and the breadth of experience uh, are the three axes of the first person experience. And in this direction here, you have maximal structure experience. And this map to uh, respectively in the, in the theory to model breadth, uh, how encompassing the model is, uh, the model accuracy and the reduced manifold simplicity or, or model simplicity. Um, so this is the relation between the first person and third person mathematical uh, version of things. So in closing, um, the philosophy of KT is not most naturally viewed uh, in the context of panpsychism or idealism, which is perhaps a more uh, rigorous philosophical background uh, where uh, consciousness is a fundamental entity and mind is everything. This is not necessary to study the scientific implications of the theory, but it's itself adopted. Uh, it, it can be motivated by simplicity and consistency criteria itself. So it's kind of pleasing in that way. From the ethics point of view, uh, just some reflections that the theory does not grant any special status of two humans, of course. All systems that capture structure experience from the world have structure experience. Um, pleasure pain is associated with the objective function of the agent uh, that I described before. This can be, for example, related to morality. We have natural notions of good or evil in computational terms. For example, uh, we may say that an agent A is evil or hates agent B if the objective function of this agent A increases when the objective function of B decreases uh, and vice versa. You could uh, talk about an agent being good to another or loving another when its objective function increases when the other one uh, increases. Synergistic behavior would emerge when agents adopt uh, this uh, goodness or love for each other, while, while mutually destructive behavior takes place in the complementary case. Now I will close. Um, so, of course, I just introduce a framework here with some ideas. Much work needs to be done. Uh, I believe that this framework can provide a unification framework uh, from uh, very rigorous mathematics to different approaches of consciousness, such as uh, IAT, global workspace theory, uh, the, uh, the um, free energy principle, uh, dendritic integration theory. These all seem to fit the theme. Um, we still need to work further on trying to map the neurobiology of this algorithmic agent. Uh, we, we pointed out the, an example with the comparator, but there are many other things to, to, to work out. A challenge that relates to the last talk is if we can computationally evolve agents, uh, these model building agents, are, this is a well, mathematical question, are persistent patterns unavoidable once you have a computational uh, system? If you wait long enough, other types other than the static uh, or uh, the static proton, persistent pattern, life or intelligence. Um, how can we discover the structure of reduced dynamics from third person data? How can, how, how can we discover these uh, manifolds, these reduced manifolds? Uh, can we design better neurophenologic methods to study structure experience? Um, can we design, based on all the above, model building agents that mimic life or intelligence? Um, is AI the next evolutionary model building leap uh, from life and intelligence, brain to brain communication? Um, and I thank you for your attention and curiosity. And I thank my collaborator, Ed and Rosé, for all the brainstorming. Um, the slides are available in this link and a preprint in is, is in, on, on its way. Thank you very much. Uh, very briefly, one question. Uh, you suggest that we uh, use short programs to model reality, the program being basically a computationally irreducible unit, right? And uh, why do you think that, uh, or do you think that reality is made exclusively of short programs, or uh, is there basically an abundance of short programs and a long tail of very complicated ones that it just takes too long to discover? Yes, thank you. Um, so two, two answers to this. One of them is that, um, well, my, my background is physics, theoretical physics, and perhaps by this deformation of my profession or my earlier scholar uh, education, I do believe that the, the, the universe is intrinsically simple. 
And there are simple laws that um, can generate all the complexity that we see. So that's, that's one answer. Um, the other answer is that uh, looking for, um, so if you are given an, a random data string and somebody tells you that this data string has been generated by a program, uh, you're, the best way to make a bet uh, on what, what program generated a string is to look for shorter programs. This is the so-called Solomon of prior. So these are the two answers I will give to your question. Thank you very much. Uh, today's Thanks. last talk um, will be given by uh, Atyom Bezerdin, who is an analytical philosopher working at uh, Lomonosov State University, where he um, holds an assistant professorship. He uh, is looking into how to understand mental states of others. When humans understand each other's conscious states, it's works best with a bidirectional coupling. Uh, and uh, he proposes to do this with uh, brain computer interfaces, starting from the insight that uh, mental processes are mostly about the allocation of attention. Oh, thank Welcome, you. Atyom. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. OK. Yes, OK. I can hear you. Yes, uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, my talk is what brain computer interfaces can tell us about the actions of uh, uh, artificial agents. Um, my primary area of research is moral responsibility and uh, uh, artificial intelligence uh, is not my main uh, sphere of interest. So uh, I try to apply something uh, from the area of moral responsibility to artificial intelligence. And uh, uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry if my understanding of AI is not uh, very deep. So um, I will start with um, a characterization of uh, an artificial agent. Artificial agent is an artificial intelligence that can directly interfere with the environment. Uh, I roughly mean uh, this. Uh, indirect interference involves other agents. For example, an artificial intelligence uh, that only gives commands to human uh, beings is not an uh, artificial intelligence is not an uh, artificial agent, excuse me. And uh, roughly an artificial agent is uh, an artificial individual that can perform overt actions that can directly manipulate uh, objects uh, in the environment and so on. And I have a specific understand understanding of action specifically for the purpose of uh, this presentation and for this research. Action is an element of agent behavior for which she or he can be morally responsible. And um, uh, to my mind, this understanding of action is uh, most uh, clear for us, for us the human beings, because uh, we are uh, agents and we know that we are agents, we know when we act, we know what we do, and we know that we are responsible for what we are doing. And this is a very precise and clear way of, uh, of uh, indicating uh, actions, the elements of actions in our uh, behavior. And uh, as far as I understand today, uh, uh, the question that is on the table in this area of research is the question of uh, moral AI, of moral artificial intelligence. And uh, there are many papers uh, concerning uh, the algorithms, the uh, principles of choice, and uh, so on, many other, many other topics. Uh, generally, these questions concern artificial intelligence as uh, a moral subject in the sense of our interaction with this subject. And as far as I know, there are not, there are not too many 
uh, papers that uh, consider moral uh, that consider uh, artificial intelligence as moral agent itself. Uh, I'm persuaded that uh, in maybe in the nearest future, uh, artificial agents will appear in our world. So we will create uh, new persons, uh, new morally responsible agents. And uh, my question uh, concerns the uh, possibility of such agents, the possibility of more responsible artificial agents. And uh, I need to clarify what I mean by morally responsible agent. To be a morally responsible agent is to be an appropriate target for reactive attitudes, such as praise, blame, uh, these two uh, reactive attitudes uh, are paradigmatic examples of this, of this type of attitudes. This is a broad Strassonian understanding of uh, moral responsibility. And uh, I ask a um, question about the, uh, the action. How can an action of an artificial agent meet the conditions that are usually met by human actions, the conditions for uh, uh, morally responsible, morally responsible actions, and uh, I want to stress that uh, the topic of my discussion of my presentation is action itself. So this is the question about the structure of the action, structure of the uh, action itself. So uh, I believe that. Uh, Generally, the causal theory of action is uh, correct. Uh, some version of this uh, type of theories is correct. And uh, the causal theories of action uh, generally say that an element of behavior is an action if it has a cause of the right sort. Uh, usually it is a, a psychological uh, cause, some mental event. And uh, for my present purpose, I uh, claim that uh, causal theory of action states only a sufficient condition uh, conditions for an action. So maybe there are some other possible explanations of our actions. Uh, maybe there are some actions that uh, cannot be explained by uh, any causal theory of action. There are various examples. Uh, but I uh, insist that uh, at least some actions are called actions because they have the right call, the right sort of psychological cause. And I take into account uh, only overt uh, actions. And then we have this question about the causal theory of action. What sort of cause do we mean? Do we need? There are various options on the table. Uh, some philosophers say that uh, they are intentions or desires uh, or want and beliefs uh, or some something else. But if we consider these, uh, these concepts, uh, it becomes clear that we uh, face more questions uh, than explanations. So uh, if we will try to uh, implement uh, intention or desire on an artificial agent, uh, we uh, may simply not know what to do. Uh, there, are, there is something very specific about human intentions, human desires, and uh, there is a big problem with uh, interpreting intentionality in uh, philosophy of consciousness and, and so on. Uh, and uh, my idea is to find, is to find an, uh, a theory to find some, uh, some way to overcome this, uh, to overcome this, and I think that uh, we can find help in uh, the case of brain-computer interfaces. 
So I uh, found some definition of braid computer interface. Uh, a brain computer interface BCI is a computer based system that acquires brain signals, analyzes them, and translates them into commands that are related to an output device to carry out a uh, desired action. Uh, I think that this is an audience that do not need uh, 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 that not need. Uh, uh, presentation of this uh, technology. I, I believe that everybody has some uh, has some understanding of what brain computer interfaces are. And uh, here is an example. Again, this is a picture simply taken from uh, the web. So uh, here is a, a subcortical. Uh, of, no, excuse me, not sub, uh, subcortical. Uh, transcranial uh, uh, compu uh, brain computer interface. Uh, so uh, here, a person imagines uh, writing the word the word hello, and this word appears on the screen. So let us take this action. Uh, for first of all, let us agree that it is an uh, overt action, and let us take. Uh, uh, let us take it as an example. Okay, uh, if we uh, if we consider the cases of actions that are performed uh, with brain computer interfaces, uh, we can uh, select. We can find out that uh, they are specific in many respects. Uh, and the, these specific characteristics of these actions give, uh, give us some advantages in studying uh, action with the uh, brain computer interfaces action. So first of all, uh, subjects learn how to use BCI. And uh, I will say that they learn how to act. They learn a new, you, if you use uh, BCI, you never acted in such a way before. And uh, this process of learning and action, and the process of performing an action uh, can be introspectively accessed by the subject. And uh, there is a possibility of objective, objective control, objective access to uh, this process. So we have some we have a chance to uh, observe the action from beginning to the end uh, with uh, the reports of the subject. And this is a unique chance. Uh, usually, we uh, learn to act in, inf in infancy, and uh, infants obviously are not uh, as good as good subjects for research as adults. And uh, actions with uh, BCI are actions because they are produced by a cause of the right sort. So uh, I will return to this claim later, but I say that uh, the structure of an uh, action with BCI is, uh, is a support itself is a support for causal theory, causal theory of action. And uh, obviously a agents can uh, be responsible for their actions uh, performed with uh, BCI. We can do roughly all the same things uh, that we can do with our, let's say, bare hands and uh, with uh, BCI. All these features are uh, important for uh, for the artificial uh, agency, as I will try to uh, to show. Uh, I have tried to, for some time to find a theory, a causal theory of action that uh, will describe uh, BCI action and action with BCI, and will not. 
uh, and will not introduce some obscure concepts uh, such as intentions, desires, and so on. And for some time, I thought that uh, idea motor uh, theory, and not old theory created by uh, suggested by William James, is a good candidate. By but uh, uh, then I found that. Uh, Kent Bach's representational theory of action. Uh, it is an old theory. It uh, was presented in a 1977 uh, paper. And uh, it's, its main claim is this, that action, unlike other behavior, it essentially involves experience of what is being done and what is to be done next, and that it counts as action only if, it's, uh, if this experience causally interacts with it. And uh, then Bach, Bach uh, introduces two types of representations. Uh, receptive representations that are awareness that are awareness of what is being done and effective representation uh awareness of what is to be done and uh, these types of representations are called executive 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 representations uh, there are some features the executive representations have some features first uh, they are not intentions. Uh, the one difference is that they are more fine-grained than, right, grained than intentions. Uh, I will illustrate this later. Uh, executive representations are not propositional attitudes, and intentions are often understood as propositional attitudes. Executive representations do not constitute a sui generis class of uh, mental states. And uh, all these uh, claims must uh, stress uh, the specific stat status of uh, these executive representations according to Bach's theory, but it uh, will be uh, more simple to use an example. Let's take the picture that I have already used. In this case, uh, the imagining uh, of uh, writing a word uh, will be an effective representation that will be a cause of some change in the environment. And uh, the letters that uh, appear on the screen and uh, uh, the letters of which uh, the agent is aware, they are the receptive. They are the receptive representation. And uh, the uh, process of uh, writing this word, hello, uh, the process of performing this action will be very fine-grained according to Bach's theory. Look, if we take uh, a different theory, uh, we can say that uh, we have only one action here, only one action that uh, is corresponding to the intention to write the word hello. But uh, that can be true. That can be true for Bach uh, in the sense that uh, this is something that we will prefer to call one action. That, that's what we usually uh, take for actions, but uh, according to his theory, uh, this big action uh, is constituted by uh, many, many loops, many uh, rehearsals of the same uh, movement between the uh, um, between the effective representation and the, uh, represent, the receptive representation, excuse me. Uh, okay, so I try, I try to illustrate this with uh, this picture. So uh, roughly we can say that uh, the agent first imagines the letter H, then 
uh, it appears on the screen, then uh, he represent, uh, imagines the letter E and so on. And at every stage, there is a feedback loop. Uh, the agent controls the action. I uh, insist that this is the uh, idea of control, that th this is the type of control that we need for action. Um, and if uh, this, uh, th there is some uh, error in this process, so the, then the agent can correct uh correct the performance of the aid of the action uh like in, in, in this way as i presented this slide as an example uh what all this uh can tell us about the um effective or executive representations uh consider this uh Mm, event this uh, imagining uh, the letters of the word hello. Uh, this Im imagination, this uh, act of imagination is not itself an, an intention and it is not itself a desire. But I must add that uh, only uh, imagination is not uh, uh, an effective representation in the sense that uh, there must be also some expectation of the effect, but uh, I'm sure that the expectation of the effect uh, can be easily implemented on artificial agents. Um, and uh, I need to add that uh, these imaginations are not necessary for uh, actions so uh, a mental event can be different and in the case of uh, BCI uh, we can also try to construct a different interface interface that will uh, uh, that will uh, monitor some other type of activity in um, our brain so uh, I believe that this scheme uh, can be implemented on, uh, roughly can be implemented on artificial agents, but there is a possible, a possible objection to everything that I have said so far. Uh, does not the agent with the BCI intentionally produce an image? Is not it an internal action that is the cause of the overt action there may be uh, internal actions i can agree with this but they are not necessary for every overt action that's what uh that's what the case of brain computer interface can show us uh that the uh, uh cause that the cause of the uh, action must not necessarily be an uh intentional internal action uh, simply because uh, some actions are not intentional but still are actions uh, as Bach writes some actions are not intentional performed too automatically routinely unthinkingly unthinkingly they are minimal actions and uh, I believe that actions uh, performed with uh, brain computer interfaces can be routinized they can be, uh, they can become uh, automatic. And uh, if it's true, then uh, the causal explanation, the causal theory of action uh, that does not involve uh, original intentions uh, also is, also becomes a true. So uh, the structure of the action can be presented in the following way, uh, if, I'm, if I'm right. So we can agree that there can be different reasons for actions. Some reasons can be external and some can be internal. And I uh, 
want to concentrate on the external reasons. So uh, an example of external reasons can be this phrase, please write hello. So we can address this to a person with an, uh, a BCI. And uh, this phrase can be a reason for action itself. And it can cause the effective representation and start the process uh, this process of uh, circulating, circulation of effective and uh, this process of action. Uh, and another, th there is also another condition uh, that can be easily implemented in artificial agents and uh, that uh, all of us meet is uh, a vet veto capacity capacity to stop performing an action if there is a reason for it. So I do not want to say that if an action is started, uh, then we cannot stop it, we cannot control it. Uh, this theory explains uh, how we can control it. So control uh, is uh, present on every step of this process. So what is my general conclusion for the artificial agents. Uh, obviously, much more elements are required to construct a more responsible artificial agents. Uh, agent, uh, so a set of general rules of choice for various situations that are subject to correction through moral reactions, a pattern of distribution of attention that gives reference to moral su uh, subjects. Uh, my talk was uh, introduced as <laughs> talk uh, on the distribution of attention, but uh, when I when I prepared my slides, I understood that I will not have time to discuss this topic. So excuse me for this. And uh, an artificial intelligence, uh, artificial agent must have a cognitive system supporting consciousness and many, many other things. But uh, my conclusion is that uh, implementation of a representational system of action, the system of action that is described by Bach, is a part of at least one sufficient condition for artificial agents being a morally responsible agent. So, of course, uh, this is not a, a sufficient condition itself, and uh, maybe it is not a necessary condition, but if we want, and I believe that uh, we uh, want and we will do it at some instant uh, if we want to construct to design an artificial agent who will be responsible or responsible for his or her or its uh, actions uh, we can use this representational system simply because uh, it is uh, it describes the way we ourselves act in the cases when we use uh, brain computer interfaces. And I think that we do not have any doubts that uh, we are more responsible when we use uh, BCI. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for this presentation.